We're now going to have a bit of an overview of the project management unit and we're going to do this overview in a bit of a mind map layout looking at the different components of the unit based on the actual syllabus of project management. So to start off with we're looking at the first unit in the HSC course project management. The first subsection we're going to look at is understanding the problem and this is also the first stage of the system development cycle which is the traditional method of project development and really the core of this whole unit. So with understanding the problem we need to know the first three things. Firstly it's about identifying problems with the existing system and then developing a requirement report that looks at what are the necessary components of the existing system and need be developing a working model such as a requirements prototype to get a better understanding of the existing system. So it really is about focusing on the existing system and gaining data through interviewing and surveying users who use the system and analyzing the system. How does it work? What does it do? And who uses it? The next stage we then look at is the planning stage. And in the planning stage, we're now looking at the development of the actual new system. Should we go ahead, should we create a new system in order to get rid of the old system and make something that works better? One of the first stages here is the feasibility study. The feasibility study looks at four areas, economic, which is money, technical, which is hardware and software, operational, which is whether participants can use the system, and scheduling, the time frame. So this would all be, have to be factored in on whether or not it is feasible, whether or not it is worth it to create a new system. We also continue on with our requirements report. Okay, so the requirements report was done in the understand the problem to gain a better understanding of the system. We now apply what we learnt in that area in moving forward in the development of a new system. So once again, what is the time frame? What subject uh, projects are necessary? Who are the participants? What information technology is being used? what data and information is being transmitted and received and stored, as well as the needs of the users. Okay, and this is kind of our foundation for when we start building our new system. The final thing we look at in this section as well is the development approaches. Now, as mentioned, this topic is following the traditional form of, of system development, which is using the system development lifecycle, though there are other types of system development available, specifically outsourcing, when we get people outside the organization to make uh, parts of the system for us, prototyping, where we are constantly building a model of the system and manipulating that model and evaluating that model to finally, until we get a perfect model of the system that we want, Customization is when we take a look at the existing system and actually tweak the existing system to actually then suit our new needs. Participant development is actually working with the participants, the people who use the system in the generation of the new system. And then there's agile methods, which is a very unstructured approach to system development in which small teams all work on different parts of the actual system. From here, once we've got everything planned out, we then move on to actually designing the solution. So the designing section. So what we're doing here is clarifying what specifically are gonna be the benefits of this new system. Okay, whether participants will play a role in the actual designing of the new system. If we're doing a prototyping approach, we're then refining the actual prototype to be what we want as our new system. And then we've got specific tools used in designing. And then this is where all our diagrams come into it. And these diagrams aren't just for this unit, but they go out throughout the whole course. So our context diagrams, which there's one circle and multiple external entities, which give a comprehensive view of the whole system. Sorry, not comprehensive, a very um, a small overview of the whole system. Our data flow diagram, which is the comprehensive view of the system, in which each sub process is also identified within the system decision trees and decision tables to help break down how different conditions will affect different actions of a system though displayed in different methods a decision tree is kind of a line diagram whereas a decision table is as I said a tabular layout and then finally storyboarding for perhaps a website or a video where you actually want to show images that represent how the actual system is going to look when we use its interface once the system is designed we then need to implement it into the working environment. So there's many stages to implementation. So we have to firstly acquire the hardware and software necessary to run the system in the workplace and install it. It has to all be set up and installed and ready to go so that people can use it. We then set up an implementation plan. 
Okay, and then we have to then also support it with documentation for participants, an operations manual, so they are able to use this new system. So key areas we need to have as a part of our implementation plan is how will participants be trained, how will they assist in testing, and how will it be converted? How will we go from the old system to the new system? There's four methods for achieving this. There's parallel conversion, which is basically running the old system and the new system side by side, but this doubles our workload because we're doing two systems at once. There's a direct um, conversion in which basically the para, um, we get the old system and we get rid of it straight away and we bring in the new system and smack bang on a certain day, we are only using the new system. Problem here is though, if um, there's an error with the new system, we can't then go back to the old system. There's a phase conversion in which components from the new system are gradually implemented Okay, and then the old system is gradually phased out as the new system is brought in until by a specific time the whole new system is in. And then finally is a pilot conversion in which a specific department or a specific store will trial the new system for a period and then once the system is deemed a success and is working fine, all other departments or all other stores will take on the new system. But at first it's piloted by one area. After this, we should be fully implemented with the new system. Once it's up and running now, we can then do the final stage, which is testing, evaluating, and maintaining. And what we're looking at here is how are we going to check that the system is working properly? Okay, Have we achieved what we set out to do when we first started planning this new system? Does it achieve all the requirements? And we may have to refer back to our requirements report once again. Okay, We'll use our operation manual to ensure that if we're looking at the operation manual, do I fully understand what's going on with this new system? Does it solve all my problems? Does it direct me in the right direction? We look at the effect on users, and then how can we modify the actual system if there are um, issues? Some of the types of tests we can do are volume data tests, simulated data tests, and live data tests. With volume data tests testing, how much can we pack into the system? Simulated data tests, where we're putting in what could likely be data from participants or users and seeing how well the system reacts to these different types of data being entered. And then finally, live data, having actual real data going into the system and seeing how it responds. The other thing and the final thing we need to look at, now this pretty much covers our whole system development life cycle. The last thing we need to look at is actually the techniques for managing the project. So really just focusing on project management itself. So we need to look at communication skills, consequences of teams that fail, project management tools, and social and ethical issues that can occur. With our actual consequences of team failure, we've got to understand that if we do not work well together, we're going to suffer as a team and as a business. So we, they could lead to financial loss because we've lost either clients or we could lose our job, which leads to us losing money. As I mentioned, the second point, we could lose our employment if we're not pulling our way in a team. So we need to make sure we all work together and we all get along and make an effort to do so. And there may also be missed opportunities. We may be doing okay at preparing an actual project and all that, but by constantly exceeding ourselves and working hard, it creates new opportunities. So we develop a reputation based on the types of products we put together. So it's important that we look at our reputation and make sure we are sustaining it, okay, in order to make sure we maximize on the opportunities come for, forward, okay. By word of mouth, we'd get new clients and get more business, possibly larger business. Okay, the final thing we'll look at here is project management tools. So Gantt charts, which are used uh, for showing the amount of time we plan on spending on different parts of the actual project management. This often is used in conjunction with schedule feasibility. Journals and diaries for documenting uh, our day-to-day -day work. What did we work on today? What are our ideas? And having it all documented down so we can refer back to it later dates, as well as explain it to other people. Funding management plans, which outlines how we plan on spending the money and how it will be allocated to different groups at different times. And communication management plans. What means of communication will take place? Because they won't only be face-to-face, -face, but they may also be incorporations of video conferencing if our team um, exists with peoples located in other geographical domains as well as clients. May also be emailing and an emailing policy put in there as well. So I hope this gives you a full and comprehensive understanding of what's involved in the unit of project management. This has been a bit of an int introduction of what lies ahead, but this gives you all the key terms that you need to be using in your HSC answers. These are the terms you need to make sure you understand what every specific thing means on this page, all straight from the syllabus. So. 
hopefully this has given you a bit of an understanding of that and good luck.